such an honor. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for inviting me and, and welcoming so me so warmly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can come home and see you. I can hear. You couldn't hear? I have to talk a little closer to you. Is that yeah. better? Good. When I was a little girl, my mother's office was in the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. And after school, at least one day a week, and often on the weekend, guess where I got to hang out? Wow. <laughs> Turns women do it deep really well. Anyway, um, every year, somewhere shortly after Thanksgiving, the museum would establish down in the basement, where most of the year we didn't get to go, it would establish an annual festival of international Christmas. And so they would have trees from all these different countries, and they would invite people to either the countries would send trees with decorations, or there would be local groups in Chicago that were creating them from their own heritage. And then each night of the week during this time, they would serve a different country's Christmas meal. So over the course of growing up, I got to taste a lot of different Christmas meals, which was marvelous. But I was fascinated with the different words people used. Okay? Bon Noel, good Yule. That's good Yule got to do with Jesus and Christ. That didn't make any sense to me. Okay. And so when I was growing up, I was trying to understand what all these words meant. <laughs> and good Yule became the hardest one to find. Because until the last 15, 20 years, nobody knew about Yule in America. <laughs> and good Yule was both pretty much the norm throughout the Scandinavian countries, and sometimes in Germany you get a little bit of that. And it's like, hmm, let's trace this down. So as I did my work in anthropology, and as I did my work in various Unitarian congregations over the last 20 odd years, and as I you know, just explored life, I began to be aware of this Yule idea. And I you know, collected bits and pieces from Wiccan literature and from, quote, pagan literature and neo-pagan literature and Celtic history. And, and, and I was in England <coughs> on this day exactly 20 years ago um, at noon on the solstice. And winter solstice, and that was amazing. The energy there just it throbs <laughs> on solstice days. I was I'm standing there at Stonehenge. So, it was beautiful to be a part of that ancient, ancient tradition. We began to be aware that Yule has existed for thousands of years, long before anybody ever wrote about a being that we call Jesus Christ. And so, I also was aware that there had been a tradition um, in the um, dying god mythology, in which there are a number of examples, of that dying god being born on December 25th. Mithras being the most example, important example. And Mithras was the, the one that the Roman soldiers tended to focus on before Constantine put Jesus in the center of the Roman Empire. So Mithras was born on December 25th, and in some traditions, Osiris was born on December 25th. Now, how do we know that? Because December 25th came with Julius Caesar. We know that because the solstice is not one day. This is the beginning of the solstice. The 21st is the beginning of the solstice. In Latin, sol, sun, stice, standing, the sun stands still for three days. And on the night of the 24th, it's the end of the solstice, and the morning of the 25th is the return of the day star, the sun. So, on the morning of the 25th, had to be the birth of the sun of the sun. And when St. Augustine participated in the Nicene Council in 325, one of the things that he did is he said, 
you know, we're going to be going off into all these different parts of the <clears throat> empire, and they all have these religious traditions, and we can't just force this on them. I know that Constantine wants Christianity to be the dominant religion in the Roman Empire, the single religion that binds the Roman Empire together, but we cannot force it on them. We must find ways to adopt and adapt. So, December 25th, in spite of the very clear description in the New Testament that says he was born in early spring, <laughs> became the birthday of the Christ. And the mass for celebrating the birth of the Son of the Son. The Son of God. Uh, there's an even more ancient tradition around who the Son of God is and so on. And when we meet on Easter Sunday, we'll talk a lot more about that. But <laughs> for now, I just wanted to give you a little space here to think about this. We are beginning a three-day process where the sun is at its furthest south, and it will rise at that point for three days, and set at that point for three days, whether it's east or west. You know, it's the furthest south that it can be. Now, if you live up there where it's dark, and the sun doesn't seem to be coming up at all, that would be terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. The sun has gone away. Is it ever going to come back? Well, it didn't come back today. Well, maybe it'll come back tomorrow. Oh, no, it didn't come back tomorrow. That would be Maybe it'll come back tomorrow. Look, the sun is coming back. There's this little tiny sliver of sun on the horizon. Yay! <laughs> 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 now, humanity is very interesting. In anthropology, we talk about imitative magic. In metaphysics, we call it the law of attraction. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> In anthropology, what we say is if we have something like what we want, then maybe it'll come, what we really want comes. And so humanity has been engaging in imitative magic for, oh, two or three hundred thousand years. <laughs> imitative magic is the sun isn't here. What are you going to do? Now, get everything you can that's like the sun out, and maybe we can attract the sun. So we light fires, we light a bonfire, right? We bring out our gold jewelry. <laughs> we bring out, and we save for the occasion, a big orange ball. <laughs> Oranges are part of this time of year in the northern climes, even though they don't grow up there. Oranges and lemon citrus fruit is a very important part of this season. How many of you have a tangerine in your stocking on Christmas morning? Mm -hmm. This is why you're being given the sun. Isn't that beautiful? We're being given the sun. How many of you get gold coins during Christmas? So the reason for all of the lights and the gold and the citrus is to attract the sun home again. The sun's gone away, we want it to come back. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. So, for me, this season really starts much earlier than when the solstice day, the Yule day. It starts, officially it starts, you know, that first Sunday in Advent, the last Sunday in November, the Sunday after Thanksgiving in our calendar, right? Um, on the, in the Catholic Church or in the Christian Church, it starts December 1 now. Originally, it was 40 days of Advent and 40 days of Lent, 40 days to prepare for the coming and 40 days to prepare for the resurrection. But people couldn't hang out for 40 days. They just couldn't make it work. And besides, it seemed to be moving all over the calendar. And then we had Thanksgiving in the part of 40 days. And so they cut it back to December 1 through 24. 
So Advent is now 24 to 25 days, depending on how you count it. In any case, for me, <laughs> that's when the Christmas season starts. And then it ends on the 12th day of Christmas, which is not December 25th. That's the first day of Christmas. That's the first day of Christmas. So December 25th is one, December 26th on the first day of Christmas, on the second day, you know, okay? All right, the third day is the 27th, the fourth day is the 28th, all the way through to January 5th. That's when my Christmas tree comes down. It goes up on December 24th, it comes down on January 5th or 6th. And we know that this is an ancient tradition because, well, Shakespeare talked about it in a certain play. Well, night. That's January 5th. And it involves all kinds of interesting twists and turns that are a lonely devolving tradition from a Roman um, solstice concept called Saturnalia. And Saturnalia was a time when there was no time. In order to keep the Julian calendar going, they had to have some days where there was no time happening. And yeah, literally, they had anywhere between 7 and 11 days where there was no time. And then the beginning of the calendar would be at the end of that 11 day period. And it usually began at the solstice, because everyone knew when the solstice was. And so there would be somewhere between 10 and 12 days, we'll say 12, um, that were, everything was topsy-turvy. Slaves would be sitting at the master's place at the table, and the family would be serving the slaves a meal during the 12 days. There would be uh, parades, the, the thing that we're accustomed to at Mardi Gras, that was Saturnalia. Okay? So it just got adopted and adapted <laughs> and got put at Mardi Gras. All right? So Saturnalia was this no holds barred, everything goes, everything's up to topsy turvy. There were a number of people who had not been able to have children prior to Saturnalia, but some of them were pregnant, <laughs> um, and a few other minor things like that. And so Twelfth Night was the end of that. It was the, the epitome, it was the, the, the capitulation, the couplet, the head of the, 12th, the whole 12 day Saturnalia. It was over the next day. And so that may explain part of why those strange gifts show up on the 12 days of Christmas, right? Right? Including five golden rings, a little bit of gold. <laughs> the part of, there's a, a theory that the 12 days of Christmas are an attempt during the Cromwellian period of England, and this is not a very well founded theory, but you'll find it online, uh, during Cromwell's period in, in England when the Papists were being badly persecuted, they sang the 12 days of Christmas as a way to continue the story of Jesus. So the partridge in the pear tree is Jesus on the cross. Okay. The um, let's see what name. Two two calling. I'm, 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 two two trellis. Thank you. That's Jesus and, and Mary, and the three French hens are the uh, kings, and the four calling birds are shepherds, and the five gold rings are obvious, and we go on from there. Thank you. I don't know why I dropped turtle dust, but thank I, you. I know. <laughs> is, is it too late to ask a question if any of the, the twelve relates to the zodiac? Well, that's a very interesting thing. It turns out that the um, both the Christians and the Hebrews, through the first two centuries of the Roman Empire, did use the zodiac as part of their tradition. And if you go to any of the cathedrals that were built between 1050 and 1250, they all have the zodiac. <coughs> so yes, the 12 days, the 12 seasons, the 12 periods of the zodiac. Um, one of my fun experiences when I went to Chartres, on one side is the, the, uh, the 12 apostles, on the other side is the 12 um, zodiac signs with the appropriate activity for each zodiac sign. So it was how people knew what to do. Mm. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to plant in this zodiac sign, we're going to mow in this zodiac sign, etc. And uh, then on the other, so actually the middle is the 12 apostles, the 12 zodiacs, and then over here are the seven liberal arts sitting on the ancient Greek philosophers, literally standing on their shoulders. In a Catholic cathedral built in approximately 1100. 
So we know these concepts were very alive throughout the Roman Empire for a very long time. And we're continually being adapted and adapted. And there's a dark Madonna in the crypt there that was there long before the cathedral was built because Jesus, Jesus, Julius Caesar went to see the Madonna in the crypt at Chartres. And he read about it. He didn't call it Chartres, <laughs> So all of this is interwoven. And that's really my message, always. <laughs> It's all interwoven. You cannot separate any of the traditions from any of the other traditions. And almost everything we do that is, quote, church at the Christmas tide is, in fact, long preceding Christ. Mm -hmm. Thousands of years sometimes. Isn't that fascinating? Oh, well, for me, the beginning of the gift thing in the year old season is on December 6th and 7th. And we have a, a gentleman who shows up then, and we have a jolly old elf that we call St. Nicholas. Huh? <laughs> a jolly old elf named St. Nicholas. This one always got me, you know, when I was memorizing the night before Christmas. A right jolly old elf. How come he's saint? <laughs> what elf could ever be sainted? I mean, the elves were in direct contradiction to everything the Catholic Church stood for. <laughs> What's going on here? So what has happened is a long pre-existing elf named Sinter Klaus in the Scandinavian and Germanic tribes was adopted and adapted with a Catholic saint, a bishop from Turkey, Smyrna, Turkey, named Nicholas, who happened to have been the youngest bishop in the history of the church, and well, so well, just happened to be at the Nicene Council, <laughs> and was very much a part of creating the Christian church. Marvelous story, and someday if I happen to be talking that close to his birthday or his same day, we'll talk about more about him, but he was associated with <coughs> children, and he did wear the ermine and the scarlet of a bishop. <laughs> That's why you see him with the red and the ermine and off the, some, with the conical hat that now is whoop. <laughs> and what we call a Santa Claus hat. <laughs> so yes, St. Nicholas was associated with children. He rescued many, many, many children from all kinds of problems along the way. And he is the one responsible for gold coins being part of this whole ceremony because he, his first miracle, quote unquote, was there were children, uh, there were, there were, there was a family where dad gambled away the dowries for his three daughters. And they were going to go sold into slavery because they couldn't marry and there was no money and all of that. And so he heard about it and he rode his white horse through the town of Smyrna, Turkey, and he whoop, tossed a bag of gold into the window, in the open window, it landed in her shoe. And so she was able to say, well, I found a few coins in my shoe. Mm -hmm. And so she was able to get married, the oldest one. And then a year or so later, the middle one comes along, and he does the same thing. And then a year or so later, whoops, it's winter. Hmm, how am I going to get this to these girls? Mm -hmm. This girl needs this. He climbs on the roof and drops it down the chimney and lands in her stocking, which is hanging to dry. <laughs> yes. So that's the beginning of that story. <laughs> what we always do in my family, or have done with my, my family, is put uh, shoes out for the kids. Mm -hmm. We put them out on the back porch protected. <laughs> And in the morning they wake up and there's a sprig of holly and a can of cane and some gold chocolate coins. And that's their St. Nicholas beginning of the season for them. We've been doing various things around crashes and candles, but that's the beginning of the gifting. And from then on we are baking and we are singing Christmas carols for the whole time until January 6th. And then I say, we're done. And I do not sing them again until the day after Thanksgiving. And then we start the wassail pot. Oh, the wassail pot. You guys need to know about the wassail pot. Anyone got a story about wassail? <laughs> Go for it. Uh, as a child, my family and I in downtown Houston were at uh, festivity thing and had some wassail. It made me really ill. Mm -hmm. 
That's my story. <laughs> Well, Christmas can make a lot of people ill if they over, over consume. Yeah. If wassailing was a way like trick or treating at Christmas. Absolutely. In fact, someone was posting a, a strange Facebook thing um, where kids were going around and they were singing and they were asking for candy. Oh, it's a ba Batman thing on um, Facebook. And I said, well, actually, that's a lot older than that. Um, trick or treating. It was part of All Hallows' Eve, and that's fine, but wassailing is very common to the whole Yule season from somewhere in the beginning of December to around Twelfth Night. And the kids go around and they sing various carols. Well, in French, song is carol. <laughs> so that's where we get the name, carol. And they're singing the songs of the season. Remember the Peter, Paul, and Mary song? Hey, ho, nobody. No drink, no money. Okay, the next verse is a soul, a soul, a soul cake. Please, good missus, a soul cake. Remember that one? Yes. All right. That was a solon. That's the name of the song. S O A L, but we usually think S O U L. They were going from door to door singing the song, you know, apple, a pear, a plum, or cherry, any old thing to make us all merry. Remember that? Yeah. So that's the kind of thing they would go around saying and they'd be begging for food. <laughs> and, you know, there would be something in the, uh, in the cellar somewhere that they could get. My goodness. In the darkness, in the cold. And wassailing was the Scandinavian version of the British solo. All right? And so, here we come, the wassailing. We'll do that later. Okay. It was moving from place to place and singing songs, and then people would bring out a cup of hot spiced cider, usually with a little something in it. Mm -hmm. Keep you warm. Yeah. And that would be what people would bring. So, Vas Heil, Vas Heil was one of the seasonal um, you know, greetings, and it means be well, it's well being, it's good health. Was Scandinavian and Germanic again, that same tribe of folks curving up from the Rhine all the way up along the North Sea. So the Wasapot goes on the beginning of the season. It's done on January 6th. <laughs> it goes, we save a little bit, about a pint, maybe a quart, tuck it in the back of the fridge. That's the starter for next year. <laughs> So, as we look at this season, we be, we're aware that everyone wants to be joyful and wants to experience peace, and yet still there's some nagging details. Don't feel good for some of us. Mm -hmm. I know there's a, a bunch of stuff going around. There's a posting I've been seeing about every three, three days on Facebook these days. I do Facebook for my business, not for fun. Um, but, but this posting is that, you know, I don't care what you say. Say Happy Hanukkah, say Merry Christmas, say Happy Holidays, say Good Yule, whatever it is, I know you're wishing me well. And I'll respond accordingly. Isn't it nice? We don't have to argue over that, how we greet each other during the time of year. How many of you get to celebrate Hanukkah? Oh, goody. Sandy gets to celebrate Hanukkah. You get to talk about that last time? The menorah? Okay, so... Judy did. Judy did. We talked about it. We did a little bit, so you know about the Maccabees, and you know, okay. So Jesus celebrated the Festival of Lights. It's in the Bible that he went to, to Jerusalem to, to be part of the Festival of Lights. Nobody said it was his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the, you know, this Festival of Lights thing is a long time ago. It was recreated, some people say Hanukkah is the justification of the, the then rulers of the country of Israel, um, but it was just an adopting and adapting of what people were doing anyway. The ancient festival of lights, well let's name it, let's make it a sacred day, let's honor it. In my Jewish family, which is about half my family, um, they do Hanukkah and every night is a different gift. So one night is socks. 
<laughs> one night is books, one night is puzzles, right? And it, so after, they get different things. And what happens is Hanukkah becomes not about, oh, what wonderful thing am I going to get tonight? Because I never think I'm going to get tonight. They just don't know what variation on that. It's about the coming together and sharing. So with my kids, what I started to do was say, you know, they, my, my, my husband, their father, is Catholic. So what we were doing was honoring the Catholic tradition from a Unitarian point of view and visiting my Jewish family whenever we could. And so it was quite an interesting season. Um, but what we started to do was to say, let's spread the gifts out through the Christmas thing so that it isn't this overwhelming thing on the morning, right? So that's part of why we started doing the St. Nicholas the Eve day thing. And there would be other points during the Advent and Twelfth Night period where they might receive a little gift that was part of the season. Or they might have the opportunity to give a little gift. And giving and receiving and exchanging gifts. How did that happen? It's as old as the solstice celebrations are. So I'd like you to imagine, if you will, that it's, you know, the harvest happened a while back, and it's been pretty cold and wet. You couldn't possibly imagine that <laughs> for a while. And you've been kind of locked indoors because there aren't cars, <laughs> and you're walking wherever you're going, right? So you're imagining this, and, and can you see how you might be using this time to do projects, mm -hmm. you know, to mend a little something or to make a little something or, or whatever. So as we go into this deep, dark time, these coming togethers in feast and light to bring forth the sun are opportunities to exchange those projects and to be giving and receiving in that way. And well into the reestablishment of the Christmas you know, partying that happened during the Victorian era, because when Cromwell came in, he shut all of that down, the Puritans, and now they weren't doing that. Christmas was about church. They didn't do anything like partying. Well, the partying maintained itself in France and Germany, and so when, and when Victoria married a German prince, he brought partying with him. So starting with Victoria, we started to have Christmas parties again. <laughs> And that's why, you know, Charles Dickens, when he wrote A Christmas Carol, there were still people who didn't party at Christmas. That's why he was, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge was like, ah, I'm sorry. You know, because you don't do that. That's, that's not the Puritan way, you know. Oh, well, maybe they want to. Anyway, so we get the Victorian Christmas, and we get the exchange of gifts, and guess what? It was little things people had made for each other, special things that, you know, that person might be able to use because they had a special need or desire, because the person who was making it had seen, oh, the, 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 their lanyard for the glasses is broken, I'll make one. Or they need a new handkerchief, I'll make I'll embroider some handkerchiefs. Or this person loves to read, I'll make them a special bookmark. Now that's what the early Christmas gifting was about. When Madison Avenue gets hold of anything, we're sunk. <laughs> and we need to recognize that we're coming out of the Madison Avenue era. I almost can guarantee you that Christmas of 2015 will not look anything like any other Madison Avenue era Christmas. It will, from this year forward, this is kind of the end. It's starting to fall apart. The idea that you have to buy and buy and buy and buy and, and, and get the biggest and the best. And you know, if, if I don't give this person something huge, they're not going to be happy because Madison Avenue expect, led them to expect that something huge. I think we're almost over the hump. <laughs> And that we're just beginning to see something more like that initial ancient tradition of, oh, here's something beautiful someone would love. I'd like to share it with you. Or, wow, you could use something. Here, let me make one for you. Yes? 
on the Yeah. And so I invite you over the next few days to be thinking in those terms. Now, and we can start continuing the, the downslide, if you will, from the medicine <coughs> and the heaps. <laughs> and begin to experience a deeper, richer, loving, giving, and receiving. So I've been giving you some hints of what I'd like you to do now. We're going to go inside a little bit. And we're going to do a little bit of imagining what it must have been like to be in the dark and the cold. There's actually that song from the dark and cold of winter. And feel what it's like to be quietly coming together. You know, it's so dark. You're carrying the torches so you can see. To come together, maybe in a cave. There's a cave that is dry and warm. And all the people from around, maybe a five or ten mile area, have been walking through the day, and it's dusk now. And we've lit our torches, and we're coming into this cave, and the torches are beginning to light up the cave, so you can see it from a distance, right? <coughs> Imagine that. We've brought a basket of, of things to share, food and things we've made. And it got pretty tired, and it got pretty cold, and we know that in that wonderful, warm, well-lit place, there's going to be a big crock of something wonderfully warm to drink. And you come into this place, and you hear the voices of children off in other directions coming toward the path, and there's some in front of you, and some behind you. And you hear moms and dads calling, and then you hear the occasional dog that's traveling with them and the baby and, and just feel that we're going to be together in this cold dark night but it won't be cold and dark because we'll be together in the light. And so there's some songs that people have been singing throughout Europe during that time. And one of them starts with this this tune. No, not the holiday in the end. I forgot to do that. I'll tell you what, no, you're, you're right. We'll go back to Dick the So what I'd like you to do is go back around to the back of the church. Everybody, get up, carry your greens if you have them, pick them up if you don't. And as we're coming into this cave, we're going to sing a song. So go around to the back of the door. Right. If you didn't bring your greens with you, so we have got us in.
beautiful and safe and clean and healthy place. That's right. And the greens in England at this time of year, there aren't a whole lot of evergreens. There are. One, in, one set in particular, feel free to dance at whatever you like. <laughs> because what there are in England at this time of year is holly and ivy. Does anybody remember that song? Yes. And so we're going to imagine, imagine if you will, what it would have been like to bring in the holly, that, that prickly ivy, yeah? Oh, there's yeah. some down there. Right. <laughs> so, no. Song, sung over and over and over again was the chant that people would sing. They wouldn't sing those other verses. They were adopted and adapted. The red berry, the white blossom, and all of that. So we don't, you know, the Yule would not include those words. It was part of the adopting and adapting in the British Isles. So we bring in the greens, we honor the greens, we praise the greens, because they are the sign that life is continuing. So we brought in the gold, we brought in the light because that brings the sun back. We bring in the green so that we know that life is continuing no matter what, no matter how dark it is. And we share gifts and we enjoy the songs because that is how we bring ourselves together and we know that love is the only power. And so we live it together. And that's what you is all about.